I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability, as well as its robust interior, are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. In many ways, permission to be an imposter is something you have to take for yourself. So if you're hearing this podcast and if you feel like an imposter, instead of trying to fight it, just try experimenting when you're in the quiet of your own room. What if I am an imposter? Then so what? Maybe the idea is that my faking it would be as good or better than somebody else's earnest attempt. So I think it's very appealing to stop fighting your fear of being an imposter and say, that's no excuse for, for staying on the couch. You know, for any area, it seems like there's a set path, there's a set formula to become the top of that area. And I think, would you say being an imposter is when there are people who come into the area without taking that traditional path? Right, yeah. But, you know, never, um, never discount what somebody can do completely on their own. And I think when you first make a decision to burn the boat so there's no returning home, right? Right. I think that's when things get really exciting because it's sink or swim and people become incredibly inventive once they become isolated and terrified. When do you think you burn boats? What was your first experience with it? So, I don't even know how to introduce you. You're like Eric Weinstein, you're managing Stein. director of Weinstein. I keep forgetting that. Weinstein, Eric Weinstein, managing director of Teal Capital. Uh, you got your PhD in mathematical physics at Harvard. You've done you're like a renaissance man i feel you're kind of i've listened to a whole bunch of excellent podcasts with you let's start off with ben shapiro joe rogan tim ferris i highly recommend people listen to you on those podcasts too because to get the wide range of your knowledge what other things should people say about you how do people introduce you you've done like a million things well i, I don't know i'm just a guy who's interested in canonical structures in the universe and try to find them wherever we can so, 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 what do you mean by canonical structure? And then I'll, I'll actually continue the intro. Well, just um, I guess what I'm what I'm fascinated by is things that are extremely elegant, very powerful. Um, there's an idea, I think, due to Richard Dawkins, that you you measure the power of an idea by what it explains divided by what it assumes. And so, the most powerful ideas assume very little and tell you a tremendous amount when you unpack them. So in general, if you're going to try to get through life, you want to find the most powerful ideas by that rubric. Okay, but let me let me ask, let me unpack that a little bit. Uh, I've heard that before, and but with the addition that also it should have some predictive ability. 
So it explain, a theory might explain a lot, like let's take Richard Dawkins and evolutionary psychology. Um, it could explain a lot, but does it predict a lot? And would you include that in you know, something that's uh, an important mental model? Sure. I mean, I think it, it does predict a lot, and I think a lot of it can be quite surprising. Um, before we get to evolutionary psychology, because that's always going to be fraught as, as people don't want to imagine that their thoughts and behavior patterns are somewhat systematized. Um, it, you just take something like the four chord song from music. Uh, I guarantee you that within the next year, someone will re release a version of the four chord song that will go uh, one, five, six minor, four, and they'll have a worldwide hit with it. And you know it's predictive because that is a formula that is known to um, underlie all sorts of hits. And it's mm. clearly not by accident or... Um, so, so, so in, uh, have you read uh, The Hit Factory uh, about these uh, group of Swedish guys who basically produce every hit song and they basically use that structure, like it's Taylor Swift, Ariana Grande, like every hit. Well, that, that's usually a bit more um, complex than simple four chord uh, songs that can be strummed around uh, the campfire. But um, yeah, I think that there are formulas and very often the formulas are sort of hidden as if they're machine tools that make the tools. Um, so the idea that you have some Scandinavian group that has figured out the DNA of music and knows how to pump out hits at will is fascinating. Why, why, why should anyone have that power? And the, the idea that there is, well, that there are formulas um, is what's fascinating. So when I talk about canonical structures, I'm most interested in ways in which the world seems incredibly complicated, but in fact reduces to a very small set of assumptions. So what's, what's another example? Well, um, you know, the, the famous ones that people all know would be, for example, the periodic table. But may, maybe, um, despite the fact that that tells you all about the chemical elements and, and uh, gives you a lot of indication of how they'll combine, most people have never seen the left step uh, periodic table, which makes clear the relationship between symmetries and orbitals and chemical elements. So, you know, that would be an example of a design innovation where just the presentation of the information uh, lays bare the underlying structure. Or if, if we were talking music, or no, not music, language, uh, the international phonemic alphabet is something that most people don't even know it exists, but it has to do with a mapping of the uh, structure of our speech apparatus into a universal notation so that you can understand how to pronounce something in any language. And so so I've heard you talk about that on, on Joe Rogan and, and Tim Ferriss, and I think it's fascinating, but it also underlines, all these things underlined how much of a kind of polymath or renaissance person you are. Like, you know, you, you have your PhD in mathematical physics, you have results there, but you've, you've you know, you've gone from that to economics to uh, obviously a deep understanding of music and language and, and economics and finance, and you're managing director of Teal Capital, so you're involved in the investing world. Uh, and, and the way I know more about you is I actually heard you speak a few months ago in New York. Dave Rubin was on the stage, Melissa Chen was on the stage, um, and it was about this, you know, the so-called intellectual dark web, a word you or a phrase you coined, which is kind of about, uh, if I was to describe it, basically the limitations on on free speech, free speech that uh, has has polarized. The U.S. or even the world on on both sides, but I would say maybe a little bit more since Trump got elected. The polar the, the limitations of free speech are happening a little bit more on the left side, and it's not a little bit. All right, not a little bit, but and 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 to note, you're from the left side. Sure, I've been a Democrat all my life, but suddenly I find you cannot even unless you agree with all fifty things on on one team, you're 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 ruined. Yeah, but that's not even true. There's no way to agree with it because it's self-contradictory. Tell me what you mean. Well, you know, if, if you, uh, are, are, are men and women different or are men and women the same? So this new movement asserts both of those things at different times in order to make two different sets of points. If you want to make the point that leaving women out um, is a 
is a problem because you don't get the benefit of diversity. You say, do you have any idea how differently women think from men? You're losing all of that perspective, which is an interesting argument. And then when you see, um, let's say, a workplace with a, uh, a lack of balance between men and women, the claim will be men and women are exactly the same and the failure to hire women has to do with um, bigotry and prejudice. And so it's very interesting. You're making two separate arguments. Both of them are individually interesting. Then you say, well, look, I've heard you make two different arguments. Let's try to figure out how they combine or whether there's a contradiction or there's something to explore. And then people get very, very angry. They, they, get, they get very angry. And it, the way you just put that kind of reminds me of arguments in relationships. So it's when two sides, the man, the man and the woman say, disagree about something. And you know, usually the way you resolve arguments is, okay, why do you disagree? Why do you disagree? What are all the options? And then you discuss what's the op, what, what option is best for the unit kind of in the middle of that spectrum between one side and the other. But here we, we've come to a place societally where uh, the, the people are not willing to acknowledge that there are options in the middle. Yeah, I don't think it's really about options in the middle or you know, compromise or common ground. I think that for some reason that we don't understand, and I, I, you know, it's interesting that both of us identify with being lifelong Democrats, something has gone completely insane inside of the left with respect to logic and reason, just even to the point where bringing up logic, reason, contradiction, I'm told these are tools of power and oppression. And um, I don't even waste time within any argument that stupid. It's just, it's so far outside the bounds of what civilized people should be discussing, whether or not logic and reason. I mean, are we going to be discussing whether ar arithmetic is biased? I, I have no idea where these people are going. Well, I, I wondered about this when thinking about this podcast, like you're obviously involved in at least questioning, you know, what's going on with free speech. People like you and Jordan Peterson, who's also been on the podcast and, and others. And my first inclination was to think, why do you care? Because I just avoid people who don't let me talk. But I guess in the workplace and in, you know, if you're, if you're out there uh, trying to make other points that you want to be, you know, people, you want people to consider what you're saying and value what you're saying, then there's some Twitter mob or just some societal mob in general that says, no, he said this 15 years ago, so we can't listen to anything else he ever says. I guess it is important to this. To, I mean, it's not even issues. close. The, 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 what we are potentially going to do in terms of our ability to uh, destroy our institutions, suppress thought, dissent, uh, completely uh, weaken ourselves and our scientific enterprises by creating a climate in which no one knows what the rules are from moment to moment, and anyone can come out of uh, any nook of your past and accuse you, and, and you you know, you feel like you have to answer. I think it's really important that people stop answering all of the accusations with information about their lives. You know, very often somebody will be accused and they'll say, well, actually I was here and I was there and I was doing this other thing. Why are you telling people? I mean, just it, if people want to accuse you of something, you know, have them have them do it through the courts and, and have it be done with, uh, you know, presumption of innocence. There's something that's going on in which, we are now attacking people's ability to earn a living as a second judiciary process. And the idea is that if we can destroy your reputation, we may not be able to get you into a court of law, but we can keep you from feeding your family. And that um, is a, you know, that's what I've been calling left Carthyism. And I, because I come from the left, we learned to hate McCarthyism during the 1950s because it was used against us and it was used very specifically to destroy progressive families. And the idea that people calling themselves progressives have rediscovered the tools of ruin that were previously used against progressives by an out of control anti-communist movement in the United States is beyond ridiculous. It's, well, it's interesting because it, it didn't just start now, although maybe it's at its the peak that it's ever been. I mean, there's always been this notion of PC culture and you always kind of had to be careful around it. But it's just, maybe it's gotten, I think since the election of Trump, it's gotten much more intense where you're either on one team or the other. And like you say, it's even hard, it's even hard to say, 
what the team is because both sides could be could be construed this with the same hate you know but that um, sounds reactive to trump my claim is is that trump was called out of the vacuum and installed as president largely because of this madness the reason i'm so against this madness is because it's going to elect us trump or worse in the eyes of the left hmm. in other words if you start going after the bedrock of american labor let's say um, you know, famously, uh, Hillary's comment about deplorables. I believe that deplorables are de democratic apostates who left the Democratic Party when it started abandoning labor uh, and tried to make up the constituency deficit by embracing identity politics. And the claim is, is that labor was a super expensive constituency and identity politics is incredibly cheap. So the donor class wanted to swap out labor uh, for identity, this is my my wife's theory, uh, Pia Milani's. But I, I think that although when, labor is a huge voting constituent, uh, you know, constituency. well, it, it is. But you know, if you have like white um, coal former coal miners in their sixties or something, and then you're you're making fun of them as deplorables because you know they're they're uh, they're, they're church going, rifle owning, um, speak your mind, uh, American bedrock. I think that it just shows that we're we're completely cut off from our own history, our own base, and you, you should never antagonize a group of people that's you know taken a really serious hit like this, which is you know in some sense a, just a bedrock constituency in this country. You're, you're opening the door of Pandora's box, and I can't imagine anyone smart wanting to do that. Why do you, why do you? I mean, Hillary's uh, obviously not the most successful campaign in the world, but she knows what she's doing enough to get nominated to be almost president. And why do you think she did that? I think that Hillary is part of a very long slide into middle brown nonsense that was used to blow out the Gini coefficients, create a tremendous amount of income inequality and asset inequality in this country. I think that when Bill Clinton figured out how to finally stop the 12-year Republican juggernaut uh, in 1992, he largely did it by copying so much of the Republican playbook that you have two versions uh, of the pro-inequality party. And I think that definitely the idea that Republicans remain the, the party of millionaires, but Democrats have become the, the party of billionaires is an interesting critique. Well, it's interesting because in 1992, I mean, at the time he was head of the, I think it was the uh, Democrat National Caucus or Southern Caucus, some, some part of the Democratic Party that was kind of the conservative wing of the Democratic Party. And the fact that he's, they're, they're now s signaled to be so on the left um, it's kind of an interesting. Yeah, but I don't even know what these words really mean. I think that we have two parties, Democrat and Republican. We can call them left and right, if you will. But you know, it, to me, it's two faces of the looting party. Of the looting party. Okay, what do you mean by looting? <laughs> well, that we've been, uh, we have this country with a tremendous amount of wealth. We have a problem with growth, and that we're not really honest about confronting our problems with growth. So just like any family that has a family business that has made it wealthy, where the business starts to begin sputtering, you have a very interesting period of time where you can use the wealth of the family. You can take loans uh, you know, against the assets. You can sell things off. And you can live in the style to which you become accustomed as you try to figure out how to restart the business. Well, that's, I think, what we've been doing for uh, you know, almost since the beginning of the 70s, certainly since the beginning of the 80s, is that we've been buying time but not actually figuring out how to really restart hyper-aggressive growth. Uh, Where do you see that? Uh, how do you see that playing out? Well, I don't think we're as invested in real science and technology and mavericks. We're not interested in employing the super disagreeable people who are strong enough to hold positions that no one agrees with them on, but are in fact necessary to overturn uh, incorrect orthodoxies. We're, we're interested in this kind of consensus, communal uh, structure that's going to choke our ability to find new sources of economic growth. We want dangerous, difficult people, people who you don't necessarily feel safe 
you know, trusting your your cat to. I mean, people who are um, aggressive, and you know, I I think often about Jim Watson. Jim Watson chooses to be incredibly unpleasant in many ways as the co-discoverer of the structure of DNA. On the other hand, he's been fantastically productive over his life. And he, I, he's a great example of someone who gave himself permission to dominate areas of science or innovation where he wasn't necessarily the expert or that informed in those areas. And I think that's part of the what makes someone dangerous is to be able to step into an area, say things out loud, and yet not be, you know, kind of challenge the 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 top of the pyramid. Well, but he's also, you know, he's offensive almost for the sake of being offensive. So I'm not saying, boy, this is the way to conduct yourself at a party or what a wonderful way to treat other people. I'm trying to say, if you want somebody who is uh, balls to the wall and trying to, you know, break into new territory and do things at the highest level of human ability, you're going to have to put up with some people like that. So, so let's, let's let's talk about that as, for a second because, and I think this is a little out of the intellectual dark web discussion, but I'm really fascinated by skill acquisition and the so-called 10,000 hour rule, you know, of Anders Ericsson popularized by Malcolm Gladwell. You've succeeded in many different areas. You're, you're an expert in many different areas. Obviously, you're super intelligent, but it seems like you've made conscious decision and permission in the same way that Watson might have to say, okay, I'm going to become knowledgeable and an expert and even an investor in other areas other than differential geometry, which you studied and got your PhD in. You but know, even, even there, I'm, I'm an imposter. Why is that? Well, I, I don't, for example, have a thesis advisor. You didn't have a thesis advisor? No. What happened? You were at Harvard. Yeah. You, you, you had some ideas. Nobody liked them. <laughs> um, you know, I think people were interested in the ideas, but I think that they were they were pretty radical in a lot of ways. Um, I'm afraid to ask what the ideas were because they're going to be way beyond. No, look, I could say words <laughs> around them. You're not going to understand right, what the right. words mean. But like, let's imagine that you had some set of equations that was thought to only occur in particular sets of dimensions, whatever dimensions are. Okay, so you have you have an assertion that these equations are peculiar to dimension four and don't exist anywhere else. And so maybe I try to show that, well, actually versions of those equations exist in all dimensions. So, you know, that sh that that shibboleth or that perspective, you know, was challenged. And if I wanted to try to relate the kind of work we were doing uh, in geometry to actual guesses about the world of particles and particle theory, you know, that that could cause a problem. And so in many ways, permission to be an imposter uh, is something you have to take for yourself. And in particular, uh, young women. So young women have confidence problems that I think are more severe even than young men because young men will often decide that they're capable whether or not they are capable, whereas young women tend to be very acutely aware of all their imperfections. Um, is that so, evolutionary or cultural? Uh, I think a lot of it is evolutionary because I think women, um, females are purposed uh, for child rearing in ways that males are not because maternity is certain and paternity was never certain before genetic testing. So I think that females tended to be the low variance version of a strategy where males tended to be the high variance version of that strategy because women couldn't afford to mess up. Um, if you know about the rigors of like early child Hood, it's a really super demanding work. And so I think a lot of it is probably innate. Um, and it's good that we have a high variance uh, and a low variance version of these strategies. You know, I think you'll find that women in general are much more reliable than, than most men on average. Now with that said, um, I think one of the terrible things is that we don't give women permission to be imposters. So if you're hearing this podcast and if you feel like an imposter, Instead of trying to fight it, uh, just try experimenting when you're in, in the quiet of your own room. What, what, what if I am an imposter? Then so what? Um, maybe the idea is that my faking it would be as good or better than somebody else's uh, earnest attempts. So, you know, I have a friend who, um, you know, taught herself forms of dance that um, she didn't have any formal training in, but it looked, certainly looked like she knew what she was doing. But anybody who was actually trained in those forms of dance would know it was, uh, it was just completely made up. So I, I think it's very appealing to stop fighting your fear of being an imposter and say, that's no excuse for, 
for staying on the couch? You know, it's, uh, you know, it, for any area, it seems like there's a set path, there's a set formula to become the top of that area, to succeed in that area. Politics was one example. You needed, you know, you supposedly needed to be in the House and the Senate and maybe a governor, then vice president, then a president. That was considered the typical path. And with some variation, that's the path that many politicians have followed. Um, with mathematics, you, you go to graduate school, you get a PhD, you become a professor, and now you're a mathematician. And I think, would you say being an imposter is when, and, and this happens in every area, there are people who come into the area without taking that traditional path. Donald right, Trump, yeah. of course, became president without taking the traditional path. I'm sure there's mathematicians who have not, don't even have a PhD, but have discovered some solution to some theorem or whatever. The guy who came up with Green's functions, which is a way of inverting a differential operator, if you will, um, I think was a miller in the middle of England, and he sent off a solution to Cambridge uh, to some famous problem. And they wanted to appoint him to a professorship. And then he said, well, really, I, I didn't even go to college. And so they forced him to get a BA before they could make him a professor. Which That's is, fascinating. How, so was he just reading like math papers all his life? Or I think what? it was kind of unclear. But yeah. you, you know, never, um, never discount what somebody can do completely on their own. If you think just like about Jimi Hendrix's strange stringing of his guitar, for, a right-handed guitar played upside down and backwards as a left-hander, it immediately took him out of an ability to like watch what somebody else was doing and just copy it because it was so different. So in some sense, it's not that surprising that he would sound that unique because nobody else was even in his same universality class. Or, you know, Stanley Jordan tunes the guitar, I think, in uniformly in fourths, which is a very uncommon thing to do. And so it puts you in a in, a, in a, just a different class. And so I think when when you when you first make a decision to uh, to burn the boats so there's no there's no returning home right I mean, like this is what the people did when they, the mutiny on the bounty when they hit right. Karen Island that they they burned the bounty so nobody could leave um, I think that that's when things get really exciting because it's sink or swim and people become incredibly inventive once they become isolated and terrified. So when have when do you think you burned boats? What was your what was your first experience with it? Oh geez. I guess asserting that I, I was not good in math. Um Pat, in high school. I'm calling bullshit on that. <laughs> no. What was your SAT score on math? Um it's really not very impressive. I mean, I don't want to talk about my SAT scores <laughs> at age fifty-three, James. What are we doing here? No, but you're saying you're saying that you weren't good at math. I can't believe that you. It seems like you're. Well, you're then, like, okay, well, then let's math. talk about learning disabilities because uh -huh. I'm sure that you have a decent podcast size, right? Yeah. All right. There are a lot of parents out there. Hey, I, I see you out there in, in Radio Land, who have kids who they know are smart, they know are, are sharp and, and bright and creative and getting it, and those kids are bringing home grades that are just so depressing and the parents are tearing their hair out because they're like I can't get you into college you're not doing your homework everything's coming back screwed up okay that population is probably learning disabled in the standard parlance but I think they're probably supposed to be our future innovators I will make the gambit that I believe that most of the innovation or a lot of the innovation is always going to come from people who are going to be written off as learning incapable and so be of good cheer. You know, there's lots of ways to be smart and underperform like crazy. And and I would much rather be, you know, appointed king of the losers. There's so much brain power in uh, in loser nation uh, compared to winner nation. It's unbelievable. So that you, you just have many more opportunities to unlock uh, unused brilliance in the loser community or the learning disabled community or the people with low self esteem. These are these are my people, and this is where I get really super excited because they're sitting on top of gold, and they just can't get it together to convert. Well, so what would you say? So again, what, what were so maybe you you burn bridges by going into math and saying I'm gonna do this, or well, I have so, some insights. So I committed to a program whereby I didn't think I was gonna finish college because there was a language requirement. I was doing terribly in French, and. You know, I, just, I had the same problem actually. Really? In French, I took five years and I got a D minus in college French after the, my fifth year in it. 
<laughs> All right, so you're one of us. <laughs> Look, but if you'd learned Indonesian, you actually would have been in great shape. Why is that? Because the orthography is the same as ours, so they use the same Latin letters. They, uh, it's not inflected for gender. It's not inflected for tense. It's not inf inflected uh, for um, gender number. It's, it's just perfect. It's, it's the most wonderful language to learn super rapidly, and it's about the most beautiful place on earth. It might be the most beautiful place on earth. <laughs> So, so, okay, so you, you decide I'm gonna go into, I have these ideas about the universe math. and math. Right, and so I just, I stopped taking required classes, I guess. I started taking all graduate courses. I loaded up like crazy in math uh, and a little bit of like advanced physics or something. And I didn't think I would graduate. And I just said, look, at least I wanna find out what the universe is all about while I'm here. And that turned out to pay off. So, um, so after you, after you, so you, so you got the PhD, you didn't have advisors. So who kind of approved the PhD? Formerly, a guy named Raoul Bott, who would be my for, you know he was formally appointed as my advisor. The person uh, who came closest to being my advisor was a guy named Dror Barnatan, who just helped me explain what I'd done to people who couldn't understand it. Um, and but it's you know it's very rare not to have an advisor in in a subject like mathematics. And then, and then, what was the first? So maybe you took some fellowships. You, you, you. Uh, but when, when did you start to branch out of mathematics? Well, I mean, I think I was always interested in anything that could be sort of systematized and explained that had a lot of power to it. Um, I did some work in economics with my wife Pia Milani, and we found a way to apply the geometry that is underlying particle theory to neoclassical economics. And we had a backwards compatible reformulation of neoclassical economics in a way that could solve uh, something called the changing preference problem. What's the, you, what's the changing preference problem? Well, if you know that question that you get asked in politics, are you better off now than you were four years ago? Well, if your tastes change over that period of time, there's no way in economic theory as it's currently practiced to compare your welfare between two points in time where your tastes were different. It's only if your tastes stay exactly the same that you can make welfare comparisons. And since so, so, so like as an example, maybe four years earlier, you liked living in a house in the suburbs, but then suddenly you wanted to live in an apartment in Manhattan, it might not seem you're better off. It's hard to measure well, if you're better let's off. Let's do kale and beef. Okay, so at some point you're thinking vegan is healthy. And then you start reading a lot of stuff that maybe you think paleo is healthier. So before you put a huge premium on kale and a low premium on beef, and then five years later you, you value beef more and kale less. Okay, so any particular basket of goods which has both kale and beef in it gives you some level of happiness. But the problem that you find between periods of time where your taste change, you don't know how to compare your two forms of happiness, because in some sense you're too different as two different people. Right, but w and when someone says, are you better off than you were before, they usually mean probably income plus assets, you know, adjusted for inflation. Well, if everything's a financial asset, you know. The, the, Just in terms of economics though. I understand that, but you know, if the idea is that you have cheaper airfare, um, but you're spending more on healthcare, and you, mm -hmm. you know, how, how much do I value travel versus health? It's not a, it's not an easy question. So we right. solved the puzzle of how to do that at a theoretical level, um, using the, the knowledge you gleaned from differential infinite, geometry or yeah, physics, exactly or, infinite dimensional gauge theory. So 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 I love the idea of this because I'm, I'm a big believer in like you know we were talking before the podcast. You had just tried doing stand up comedy, obviously. You, you had never done it before. There's a certain amount of skills involved, but you've done public speaking before. Right. You've had knowledge, you've had, you have, you've had a vast array of experiences and knowledge that you were able to bring onto the stage with you that maybe other comedians didn't. So in a sense, you did the same thing. You borrowed from other categories you were expert in that the audience maybe wasn't, and you were able to use that to, to um, perform like an expert on the stage that time. So in this case, you borrowed from physics and math without necessarily having a, an economics PhD, and were able to do something, you know, interesting. Yeah, I think nature has very few games that she knows how to play well. And so, if you learn those games, 
you're quite correct. You can you can you can't necessarily just take them wholesale from one field to another, but you can port them in that you have to make certain adaptations to use them in a new place. You right. know, like so for example, you know, jokes uh pattern recognition. How many jokes you have an incident that happens, you have a tiny variation on the first incident. So two incidents sets up an expectation. The third one treats the first two formally and then does something completely absurd, which you didn't realize also fits the pattern. You know, like that doesn't sound like a joke, but the number of Jewish jokes that that unpacks to is enormous. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll sign up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match. Up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like The key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, 
The quality speaks for itself. It's like these masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. So on the one hand, you could be a a classic stand-up 20 years, writing down jokes and getting that formula, or you could have lots of experiences in life where this actually happens and you just say what happened and that also works. You know? Right, or like particular words or sounds have more humor value. So, you know, people have, have commented numerous times that the word pants or, you know, pickle or igloo, these things are funny. Yeah. It, they shouldn't be, but, you know, if you have a choice of like which word to use and what cadence and, and you know, there are all sorts of techniques that, I guess um, if you can if you can talk to somebody who really appreciates craft, they can give you a huge leg up. Where you know a joke that's sort of an okay joke that you might tell at a party can be really souped up by somebody who's fantastic. I just saw Joe Rogan rework the same joke about wrestling, I don't know, four times, and it's the same joke, but it's you you'd never recognize the thing. He just mutates it until he gets it right. There's a great example of um, Jim Gaffigan telling on stage the very first joke ever just like there's some joke in hieroglyphics from thousands of years ago and it's some it's a it's a fart joke and jim gaffigan retells the joke but in his style and of course it's very funny but it has the same kind of structure but you know so it's interesting so what what are in terms of this meta learning like how do you take one area of life into another do you think there are kind of core principles to to understand when you're, you know, because there's a lot of people also take physics and turn it into garbage when they bring it into self help or whatever. Sure. Uh, so what's what's maybe some core ways someone can look at being, you know, taking something that they're expert in or interested in, bringing it into some other area where they're in the beginning an imposter, but they make the jump. So I'll give you I'll give you a, a weird example. The neutrino was discovered by noticing that when a neutron is left alone, it sort of morphs into a proton after, I don't know, half, half-life of about 12 minutes or 18 minutes, I can't remember. Um, when you look at the electron that gets shot out of this new, neutrino, if you add up the energy of the proton and the electron, it doesn't have as much energy as the neutron did to begin with. So it would seem to violate conservation of energy. Wolfgang Pauli had this crazy idea. He said, I bet there's a secret particle that we can't see because it's electrically neutral that's carrying away the missing energy and we just don't have any ability to trap it. That was a crazy, audacious statement, but it was necessary to to save the principle of conservation of energy and momentum. Okay, let me give you a different puzzle. Tower Records on Sunset, where uh, I grew up in LA, and it was the record store that I used to learn. You know, it was a music education for me. So it closed at some point. Now, my claim is very often that the the invisible world is discovered by the visible world's failure to close. That is, in the neutrino case, there wasn't enough energy in the proton and the electron, which are the decay particles that you can see from the neutrino. So something invisible was happening to, so, car- to carry it Something failed to, to, to follow the law. 
right? There's some missing force, right? Mm -hmm. So the um, in the case of Tower Records, what killed Tower Records? I don't know. Maybe it was a file sharing network. You couldn't see it, but that file sharing network might have been what took Tower Records down because otherwise it should have been a thriving music store, right? Or, you know, a bird slamming into a glass pane repeatedly. It knows that if that was just air, it should be able to proceed, but something is causing like that that window is part of the invisible word world to the to the bird. So the fact that I'm trying as a bird to fly in a straight line and not progressing is the visible world's failure to close. So Tower Records, though, uh, it could be argued the, the internet brought you know Tower right. Records. So that would be the internet would be if you couldn't see it otherwise, it would be an invisible force which caused Tower Records to uh, to go the way of the dodo so, bird. So so an innovation comes when you start to see. Tower Records sales going down, and there's no, and Tower Records is run, let's say, magnificently. Right. Um, there's some missing force, and then you could say, oh, the missing, fo if you could figure out the missing force. Where's then, the neutrino? Yeah, you could start an online business selling CDs, then that's how you could take advantage. Right. So that, that would be a trick that I would learn from physics that I would try to apply to commerce, which is look for some visible system that is failing to behave normally. Assume that if it isn't behaving normally, there must be some unseen thing. Go look in the invisible world for what is causing the visible world to no longer make any sense. So, for example, another case of this, um, you know, might have been on Twitter, where originally all of these people who were very influential were finding each other and amplifying each other's voices as a real challenge to the mainstream media. And at some point, we noticed that we stopped seeing each other's tweets, like we we just didn't see them. And um, sometime later, you know, this guy uh, James O'Keefe, who does this undercover yeah. stuff, you know, you, you don't have to love him; you can hate him. But one of the things he recorded was um, people saying, "Oh yes, we we downrank the bad people on Twitter." You're like downranking? <laughs> What's that? Uh, oh well, you know, we use the algorithms to sort of suppress to downregulate their tweets in favor of other people's tweets. And so maybe you you discover that somebody's got their finger on the scales because you know what the visible world should do in the absence of somebody tampering with the measurement equipment. So so I love this idea of looking for the the missing force or using this this metaphor. Um, where's the neutrino? Yeah, where where's the neutrino? I love that. So uh, what's what's do you want another one? Yeah, yeah. I want I want t ten more. <laughs> All right. So here's another one. Whenever you have something that you think is just going to be beautiful, and it's a very naive hope, almost always your hope will be dashed because it's too naive. So instead of just getting upset about it, the next thing to do is to uh, measure the failure of your original hope to obtain in the world. Like, how badly did it go wrong? How do I measure how badly it's off? And then once you have that, make that new object the centerpiece of a new theory, and you'll actually build something much more beautiful than the original theory ever was. So, so for, here's a simple yeah. example. You're at the equator, and you want to go north, and you notice that you have a compass, and the compass points north. Well, magnetic north is an excellent proxy for true north right up until you get to Canada, and then it starts to get lousy. And you know, if you're up on Ellesmere's Island or something way up in the north, you can actually have magnetic north 180 degrees off of true north. Yeah. So what is that object? The object that measures that failure is called the angle of declination. So making the angle of declination the centerpiece of uh, magnetic navigation is the right thing to do. Or a different one would be, um, you know, uh, we were just talking about this on Joe Rogan. Um, if you have a normal staircase and you go up one set of stairs, uh, and you come down another set of stairs, let's say made by the same people at the same heights, you might expect that it's the same number of stairs going up as going down. But in the Escher staircase, uh, if you have that in your mind, or the Penrose stairs, you can sort of see that you can keep going up and then you get back to where you, start, you started. Well, something is clearly wrong about that. The idea that the number of steps up is the number of steps down fails to be true in, the, in that picture. And the thing that measures that failure, like how badly did my naive hope fail? might be called the holonomy or the curvature in mathematics. So you make the holonomy or the curvature the centerpiece of your theory. And in fact, in physics, 
two so of so our three so most important equations, Einstein's equation and the, the the modern version of Maxwell's equations, are based on a curvature object, which is measuring this failure of steps to behave in a regular fashion. And the more they go towards the Escher staircase, the more the curvature is intense. And that would be perceived by us in some system as greater electromagnetic field strength. So uh, let, let me try to understand the Escher example because what resulted, of course, in, in, in one way of looking at it was Escher's works of art is all based on this idea that you could look at something that looks physic like it's following the laws of physics, but it's not, and that's what creates the beauty of it. So... So do you think that was part of his creative process is like how can I how can I break this law of, of nature and create something beautiful as a result? Well, he, he was he was playing at many different levels. So for example, the stairs that he creates are they possible or are they impossible? Well, you can actually create a model and take a photograph of it and it will look exactly like the Escher stairs. So you can actually see the effect with real objects provided the camera is positioned in the right way. Now, does it have the effect that the system is actually closed and it goes around and around? No. But in a system where you actually have curvature, like on, on a sphere, like normally you think if I turn 90 degrees, walk a distance, turn 90 degrees, walk a distance, same distance, turn 90 degrees, walk the same distance, I'd have to turn 90 degrees and walk the same distance yet again. But if I did it from the North Pole to the equator, then I turned 90 degrees and I walked along the equator of, for about a quarter of its circumference. And I turned 90 degrees again and walked the same distance. I'd be back at the North Pole. And instead of having done a square, I would have done a triangle, right? So because of the curvature of the earth, that naive rule about needing to turn four separate times to get back to where you started is not true. You only have to turn three separate times. Now, in part, what Escher was really doing was playing with the curvature of a curved system, the optical illusion in a flat system. There was, there was a lot going on in that example. And so it's both an illustration of a real, under, uh, a real phenomena that we see in electromagnetism. It's, both an, op, it's an optical illusion. It's an invitation to curvature. It's presenting curvature in a flat world. There's so much happening there that it's not easy to, to pull apart. And that's why it was fascinating as a subject. And I think Escher was very knowledgeable about mathematics. And what he did was he, he used it as a source, but he combined enough of our world and our imagination that he really excited the human spirit. He took something that was very austere and perhaps forbidding, and he made it warm and, and inviting. And so, so, so let's say I'm trying, to, I'm trying to figure out different ways to make this functional. Let's say, you know, you, you mentioned earlier, a lot of people create something that they think is beautiful and they're usually wrong. So for instance, anybody who begins the process of writing and they've never written a, before, there's a certain arrogance that they think, but they have to have this arrogance to write the book, their very first book. There's a certain arrogance to think, oh, I'm going to write a book and it's going to be great because it's the first time they're writing it and other people have written for far longer and learned different skills and, and so on. But how would, how could someone beginning any skill acquisition, and let's just pick out writing, use this idea of this neutrino metaphor to kind of push the envelope a little bit to, to measure where the well, failure I don't know. is? Well, great that's a great improv challenge, but let me try to accept it. Now let's take J.K. Rowling and Harry Potter. Okay. She wrote a book for the very first time, and it was the biggest hit ever. Right. So that what, does... what was the missing neutrino? That she sort of found. Well, I don't think that that where where was the naive hope that was dashed. Well, she did write a book that tw her the first twenty or so publishers rejected, so nobody thought it was good. And well, that's a different thing. Yeah, that, that has a, that has to do with anything truly new will be compared to the old, and if it's new enough, it will always be found wanting by the standards of the old. So this is the same problem with. Um, you know, Bohemian Rhapsody. It's like what we're going to do with like a seven minute fake opera song to be played on rock radio stations. Obviously, it's, it's either the dumbest idea of all time or it's the greatest idea in rock and roll. Yeah. Right. And so something new being rejected, I don't think fits this. But l let, me, let me accept your, your gambit of the writer. Okay. So imagine that you say, oh, I'm, 
I'm a genius writer. I'm just going to sit down and the brilliance is going to come. And first draft is always amazing. Okay. So you write your short story, it's a two pager, right? And then you show it to your friend who's a professional. And your friend takes one look at it and says, Look, you're bloated over here. You're anemic over here. Let me do some stuff. And she fixes it or she sends you back and you do 18 revisions. Now, the object that would be the thing that measures the difference between your naive hope and the reality that seems to be true would be the the diff file. How much did the file change between the first offer and the final product that everybody agrees to be good? Well, you might notice that if you define the diff file for each project, that you always start off using the same crappy, flabby words. Or you know, lots of wiggle words, or way too way too poetic, or way too anemic. Right. Who knows? Once you start noticing what it is that you always do at first, you can then say, "Huh, I'm going to try to write around my diff file, which is that I, I always use the word thoroughly too much, you know, or mm-hmm. basically." Now you notice how often people use the word basically in their speech. So you know, a public speaker might look at all of their ticks. And then say, I'm going to create a file, an audio file that just just looks at all of my verbal ticks. Once you start focusing just on your ticks, you have something to minimize. You could put it into an objective function. Okay, and so so that would be an example of you know I'm a I, I naively think I'm a genius at everything that I say or or write uh, is instantly brilliant. You notice that that's not true. Then you figure out how things revise over time as you go through that cycle then you start studying the object that measures the revisions and then you try to minimize that object so you become a better writer from the get go and so so in in your case with the writer um and you've addressed this before the idea of somebody who is self-taught then having something to be able to teach but in your example of the writer he he still had to go to it or she had to go to an expert who Helped create that diff file for the first time. Mm-hmm. Do you think that's necessary to find, you know, so this is deliberate you need practice? need feedback loops. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you could manage your own, and sometimes you need somebody, um, you know, to be on you and to point out that you're actually av- avoiding the negative in the feedback that you're getting or that you're misinterpreting the positive. And so, and so the other question is, is that, then is that person who's giving you the feedback just forcing you into conformity? And so, okay, you know, this person's saying, you know, you use basically too much. Real writers don't do that. And now you're moving back into conformity. Well, hopefully, the person is pushing you back into conformity where you need conformity and pushing you into brilliance where your edge is. But the idea that, that you should either be brilliant and different in everything that you do or not. Uh, is preposterous. So, you know, I often give people the advice that if their ideas are truly radical, they should dress very conservatively. Why? Because, you know, you, you can't afford to turn everything up to 11 without distracting the hell out of whoever you're trying to reach. Yeah, so, that reminds me of, um, you ever see the Eric Andre show? No. <laughs> okay, so it's basically the premise is it's a late night talk show um, in a bodega, in the back of a bodega. And uh, but it's a spoof, but nobody knows it's a spoof. So celebrities have gone on the show not knowing that Eric Andre is just going to do something completely insane that's going to freak them out. And what's fascinating is every component of a late night show is in the format. So he's got a band, he's got a sidekick, he's got a desk that he's, he's got notes, he's reading off the notes like David Letterman. It looks exactly like the format of the David Letterman or Johnny Carson show, but he changes this one thing in that he's going to make fun of the guest in some way. And so, so to, to what you were saying, keep the format, change one thing, and now you could have brilliance. Sometimes it's one thing. Sometimes it's several things. Like if, it, if, you if think it's about, several things, though, it might be so far from the original. Well, but like, let's take the Matrix. Hmm. So the Matrix, uh, when it first came out, was very was very fresh. What did it do? Well, first of all, it used CGI at some level that we hadn't seen before. So it was computer generated in the extreme for its time. It used Hong Kong wire work on non-Chinese, non-Asian actors. It used the bullet time system of using a bunch of still cameras uh, arrayed in a like a semicircle um, to give a movie 
uh, sense of like a flip book as you were going around the subject of somebody who's in midair. So just take like those three things. Those things were all so different from each other that you could never tell what was happening exactly. Was it some new photographic innovation? Was it uh, an acrobatic innovation? Was it a computer innovation? Other than that, the storyline was very um, was very much in a kind of a revealed narrative arc hero's journey story. Right. So but, I, would, I would say that was the exact hero's journey, and they changed one thing, which is technically how we make. But the movie. what I'm trying to say that one thing had multiple components. So that right. I just gave you three. In, in other words, it's not the case that you can only choose one thing, but you have to have your you have to have it be balanced between that which people expect and that which confounds and I think I remember reading Leonard Feather the jazz writer um, talking about studies that were done that said that in, in improvisation the audience is always making a guess as to what's about to happen next and his claim was that if the audience guesses right about half the time they find it fascinating hmm. if they guess right all the time they find it boring and if they guess none of the, right none of the time they think it's modern jazz and they couldn't care less right so you have to keep some of the structure so, so Tower Records had to keep some of their structure. They had to say, okay, we're, we still still sell music, but now we're going to do it online. That was the missing. Well, IBM would be a good example of, of something that isn't, it's, you know, it morphed over time to continue to, to be a, a major player in tech, whereas lots of other tech firms uh, couldn't figure out how to morph and change. And, you know, what is the abstraction of your former business in today's terms? So I, I, this idea of a missing force, and of course you can't, on the surface, the whole concept is it's missing. You can't see it's a missing force. Where else do you see this in entrepreneurship? Where have you seen it successfully played out? Well, very often if you can notice that there is um, a missing need that people hadn't really... Uh, and that's like an, an insight. So like Steve Jobs saying every home is going to have a, a, a microcomputer. You know, the, the missing force in computing for him was why can't I have it all the time? Or maybe the idea is that, um, hey, I've also noticed that not only do I know that there's going to be a computer everywhere, but that it's going to be so integrated into your life that the design feature of this that tech people never get right is my chance to add value. And I'm going to bring elegance and canonical aspects of design to something that has to be integrated into the very fabric of your being. So we welcomed Apple in in part because it flattered our sense of ourselves that we are elegant, we are spare, we are courageous. We think different as they told us. We and still to this day, like kids get the iPhone because culturally that look that's the coolest phone to get. Although in, you know, post Tim Cook's uh Chilling's Orwellian speech about uh Things having no home on his platform. Um, my God, uh, you know how many of the people that Apple has held up to us when they told us to think different would be reviled um, right now as being hateful to somebody? I just don't know. No, and it's 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 scary when you're not a Tim Cook, when you're not an Apple, when you're just yourself. It's scary going up against the the monster of Kind of this, you know, conformist groupthink somehow, and and I'll I'll, I'll get to that in a, in a second. But I'm still very interested in this this skill acquisition aspect. What what kind of core? You always talk about core principles or first principles. What what sort of first principles or or basics do you think someone needs to develop that muscle of looking for the 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 missing force, the neutrino? So obviously Wolfgang Pauli, he had a background in physics. He was able to kind of say, huh, it didn't follow this law. Something has to be there. And Tower Records, they didn't have that. They, oh, sales are declining. We're running the company great. Sales should be going up if we're running the company great and people are listening to music. See, they somehow they missed the missing force. Sure. I mean, I think that one thing you could do is you could just say, um, make a note to yourself. Uh, I'm about to have a conversation with Jane. I wonder what's going to happen. I think it's going to go well. Um, and you have a conversation with Jane and it ends up with Jane yelling at you, get out of my office. Okay, well, 
Is that something that typically happens that you think you're going to go into a conversation and you think it's going to go great and somebody gets really angry at you? It, you can find somebody who repeats the same error over and over again and never gets metacognitive or curious. So one thing I would say is before you start trying to do anything new, if you find that you're frustrated in your life and that you can't get past certain objects or obstacles, um, just learn how to do this thing I call watching your robot. So most of what gets you through a day, you're not even thinking about. It. You, you don't think about it, how to put one foot in front of the other because you learned to walk ages ago. As you learn all of these things, they become automated. So a really interesting activity is to just watch your body and your brain make mistakes. Like for example, I ordered a burger for lunch. And it came with fries. And I said to myself, they always give me fries and I always eat them and I always regret it. And then I watched myself eat the fries after having that thought. And instead of trying to get myself not to eat the fries, I said, I'm just going to watch myself being an idiot. Isn't it interesting that my robot is just in an automated mode making a decision that I've decided to do the opposite of and my robot is winning? Well, that doesn't sound very encouraging at the beginning, but... I guarantee you three times of, of having that conversation with myself, eventually I can't stand to watch my robot take over the ship anymore. So it seems like what you're saying, um, have a mental model, it, given a situation, and maybe it's a high stakes situation, like right. you're going to write a book or run a business or run a particle accelerator and see what happens. So given a high stakes situation, build a mental model beforehand of what you think should happen. Uh, let's say you're going in to have a discussion with your boss or your girlfriend or whatever. See what happens. If there's a difference, and if the difference, if there's a difference and, and view that difference as kind of a robot that you're observing from higher, and then if you see that difference enough and it's you're feeling bad about it, the solution maybe is some innovation or some beautiful solution. Or, or just getting con control of the situation. And don't start off with the, like the big, the big meeting or the, the big project or the big deal. Because usually mostly what, what we're doing wrong is fractal. And it, it's, you know, mm -hmm. if, if, you're, if you're blowing big deals, you're probably blowing little transactions, buying a candy bar at the bodega. You know, you, you're probably screwing that up too at some level. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe, maybe you're too friendly. Maybe you're not friendly enough. I don't know. But, Definitely find the cheapest places to practice because there's no sense learning in the highest stakes environment possible. So, so let's take this to the you know you coining the phrase the intellectual dark web. You felt free to express opinions among the select group of friends and colleagues you chose to be around you on a daily basis. You 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 feel comfortable saying what you think because they don't. Uh, slander you for it or ruin your career for it. No, I don't feel comfortable saying that, I think. <laughs> I just can't stop. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so... How do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.